Right. Yeah, should we begin? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ravinder, and I welcome you all to this session on instrumentation and techniques for. So, in this session, we have total five talks. Uh, first talk is for 30 minutes, and rest four talks are for 15 minutes each. And since we are running late, uh, I would request all the speakers to adhere to the timings. So the first speaker for, uh, the, for, for the session is Ramya Seturam. She's going to speak on conceptual design of wide, wide field optical spectrograph for TMT. So Ramya, uh, you will speak for 25 minutes and five minutes for the question answer sessions. And I will uh, inform you when you have three minutes left. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me begin my talk uh, uh, by thanking the organizers, the SOC, uh, for giving me a chance uh, to bring out the contributions which the India TMT uh, is uh, uh, significantly providing to the conceptual design of wide field optical spectrograph. This is uh, TMT is one of the first light instruments and uh, it will be uh, doing uh, wide field imaging of and optical spectrography, spectroscopy. So uh, here what I show is just a rendering of TMT on Mauna Kea uh, behind the starry sky. Um, uh, so this is uh, the cross-sectional view of uh, TMT. It's a Ritchie-Christian design. Uh, it has a 30 meter uh, uh, primary mirror. It's a segmented mirror and uh, uh, 492 segments, uh, which are hyperboloid. Uh, we have a, a secondary mirror, which is a 3.1 meter convex hyperboloid. Uh, and the light from the secondary is uh, uh, falls on the tertiary mirror, which steers the uh, light into the in science instruments, which sits on the either side of the NASMIC platform. So one of the uh, sides of the NASMIC platform is uh, 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 solely for the adaptive optics uh, systems, which is fed by uh, the TMT's adaptive optics system, Nitharios. So on the uh, other side of the TMT uh, NASMIC platform, you have the seeing limited instruments. And one of the instruments which I have marked here is nothing but the wide field optical spectrograph. So we would also see uh, HROS, which is a second generation optical high resolution spectrograph coming on the same NASMIC platform over here. So uh, uh, coming to the WFOS, WFOS is uh, acronym to be wide field optical spectrograph. Uh, so the PI of this instrument is Charles Tidal from Caltech. Uh, PS is Eric Peng Kavli Beijing and uh, uh, PM is the, David Elasi from TMT. And uh, this is how the uh, wide field optical spectrograph looks. It is a, uh, almost a three story building with uh, only the rotating structure with four meter it in height. And here I have marked several uh, different subsystems which I will go in detail in each of them. So the WFOS collaboration is between four countries, uh, uh, US, that is especially Caltech, um, uh, China, Japan, and India. So what are the uh, requirements of WFOS? The top level requirements of WFOS is uh, to take the spectra or to obtain the spectra of the faintest objects in the optical band. It should take the full advantage of the 30 meter aperture and it should give a full wavelength uh, coverage at least at the lowest resolution, which is about uh, uh, R is equal to 1500. Uh, for characterizing these faint sources within the redshift range of two to five compared to eight to 10 meter class telescopes. The sky subtraction should be good. The accuracy of size, sky subtraction should be better than 0.1%. Uh, we expect about 10 hour of integration times where the mechanisms uh, should be in place and working for the 10 hours continuously. And uh, these, uh, this instrument should be able to do a uh, follow-up of winter sources, which is detected by uh, future generation or the next generation w JWST, LSST, and gravitational wave sources. So uh, coming to the optical design of uh, WFOS, the design considerations are again and coming back. It should be able to do a significant multiplexing of at least 50 to 100 objects. It should be able to do an imaging and also a single target spectroscopy. 
So it should be uh, most efficient uh, low to moderate resolution spectrometer, which means it should, uh, it should be able to preserve the aperture advantage by collecting most of the light. Must provide a versatile range of uh, spectral resolutions uh, serving both as a discovery, uh, uh, discovery instrument and also for deep diagnosis of uh, various sources. It should work from uh, 310 to 1000 nanometers. Uh, it should be limited only uh, by the UV in the uh, blue and by the silicon in the near IR. So at least this gives us uh, um, uh, that at least there are two wavelength channels. And uh, the, uh, since there are two wavelength channels, we can work more on the blue or UV throughput and need not be compromised for single channel optical spectrograph. Um, so it should cover uh, entire wavelength in a single setup, at least for a low resolution, 1,500 uh, resolution, assuming 0.75 axiom slits, entrance slits. So, uh, so it should also be capable of uh, providing um, spectra at a resolution of 3,500 at any wavelength between 310 to 1,000 nanometers. So uh, what do we have here on the right side is uh, when the, uh, the tertiary meter steers the light into the W force, the first element it encounters is the ADC, the atmospheric dispersion corrector, which is a linear ADC. I will, come, uh, I will go into the details of each instrument, uh, each subsystem uh, in the upcoming slides. Uh, the ADC is a linear ADC, which uh, uh, the two prisms are separated, uh, separates uh, in the distance linearly when uh, to correct for the atmospheric refraction effects. So the next element is the M4 mirror. It's a two meter uh, uh, mirror, which uh, steers the light into the vertical direction, making the whole system gravity invariant, uh, which means that uh, the subsystems will look at the same gravity vector when it moves across. Uh, well, there is uh, the slit mask exchanger, which is a mask uh, and uh, slits of various uh, sizes can be carved out on these masks. And at a time simultaneously, uh, about 50 to 100 objects can be observed. So the, slit the light from the slit mask uh, uh, exchanger will be collimated using a set of two uh, collimator mirrors, M1 and M2, which are aspheric. Uh, one is aspheric and one is preform collimators. And uh, uh, after collimation, it is split into blue and red channels uh, uh, based on the dichroid at 5,500 angstroms. And uh, the blue channel, uh, after getting folded, uh, disperses through a transmissive grating and then is captured onto a um, uh, blue camera, a blue CCD. Similarly, uh, the red is uh, the red light is transmitted, uh, folded using two folds and uh, dispersed using again a transmissive grating over here. So coming to uh, the mechanical package, this is how the WPOS would look on the national platform over here. And uh, uh, what you see is in, inside the static structure, once you remove the static structure, the whole system so it looks something like this. Uh, uh, so um, uh, the, top the top portion is where I just spoke about the linear ADC, the M4. And on the right side, you see the calibration system, which, is, uh, which will illuminate the slit mask uh, using an integrating sphere. We'll come to it in detail. Uh, if you strip off the static structure over here, along with the slit mask uh, cassettes sitting over here, you, what you see is a rotating structure. The whole of this uh, four stage rotates for instrument correct, instrument rotator, as an instrument rotator. Uh, so this is a seeing limited uh, spectrometer, 310 to 1000 uh, nanometers. It gives uh, three different resolutions uh, at various slit widths, at uh, 0.75 axicon slit widths, and we can achieve various other spectral resolutions also, as I'll show you how. And uh, field of view is 25 arc minutes square. It has two arms and multiplexing of 50 to 80 objects. So the mechanically, this is a 8.3 meter tall, 5.5 meter wide, 7.5 meter long instrument. It weighs 42 tons. So it has uh, many sub-assemblies and uh, many uh, motors. So the pre-spectrometer subsystems, as I mentioned to you, are ADC, F4, uh, slit mask exchanger, the guiding and wafer and sensing system, and the calibration. 
We'll go into detail of each one of these. The ADC, uh, the atmospheric dispersion character is required because to correct the uh, atmospheric refraction. So this is uh, greater than two arc seconds, even at modest resolution, as you can see here. And uh, this particular uh, uh, set of two prisms move linearly and also rotate to correct for the field rotation. Uh, and uh, you get the ADC corrected beam, something like this. So um, the next system is the M4 system, which will direct the light vertically downwards. And also the M4 uh, will also correct light from the calibration system by rotating by 90 degree in the horizontal axis uh, once the calibration is required. So it will also correct, correct for small tip tilt errors of 0.1 degree, uh, 0.1 degree or so, uh, which is created, which we call it as the pupil shift, which is created from the ADC. So uh, this M4 mirror is already a two meter in diameter. We have the slit mask, which is the most, uh, 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 most complex system. This is, uh, I have mentioned here who is leading the efforts here. Uh, I, I forgot uh, to mention it here. Uh, Caltech and Xi'an from uh, uh, US is leading LADC effort. Caltech is leading the M4 effort. And NAOJ is solely taking up on the slit mask exchanger because of, uh, um, uh, because of uh, their, um, uh, 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 yeah, their heritage with uh, Subaru uh, telescopes uh, and, and the uh, science instruments there. So uh, the slit mask exchanger has uh, several assemblies. Uh, uh, one person manually loads into the slit mask cassette. And this, uh, this, is, this cassette, once loaded, uh, slowly moves up into the carriage. And from uh, this carriage, uh, the, uh, the required slit mask comes and uh, positions itself on the uh, focal plane over here. So um, uh, that is, um, uh, the, that is how the slit mask places itself. So the slit mask will be slightly larger than the field of view. Uh, the field of view is 8.3 by 3 arc minute uh, square. That is, yeah. So the next subsystem is the AGWFS subsystem, which is the guiding and wavefront sensing. This sits on either side of the slit mask exchanger over here and helps to guide uh, and keep the targets, uh, um, uh, keep the targets in the slits. So uh, the AGWFS system is itself a complex system. Uh, it, uh, it looks at the field, not the science field. It looks at the field slightly away from the science field over here. It has four patrol regions and the camera is itself a one arc minute camera. Uh, uh, this camera uh, collects the light. Um, uh, the, the light collected will enter into a notch filter and the notch filter, uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, a split is taken into a LGS F WFS system. This will come only as an upgrade in the future uh, WFOS. But right now, um, uh, the guider will uh, collect the light and uh, collimate through a set of uh, collimators. A dichroic will split the light and uh, send uh, into uh, WFS. It's the natural guide, uh, guide star wavefront sensing system. And the remaining light will enter into the guide, guider system. So the guider system here is about uh, the guider camera is about five arc seconds in diameter. It will be looking only at the guide box or the star which is being guided. So uh, that's there are uh, four uh, AGWFS systems. Uh, the four petrol fields at least provides greater than 97% of the sky coverage, even in the galactic poles. And right now uh, we baseline to Gaia system uh, and the Gaia system uh, with a G magnitude of 20, 21 magnitudes in the G band will be able to provide 2,500 stars per degree square with, uh, with accurate asymmetric positions. And this is sufficient to at least have three guide stars in any of the fields. So um, uh, this is uh, the optical design of uh, calibration system. This is all pre-optics uh, sitting on the static structure over here. And the calibration system is an uh, optomechanical design completely led by uh, the Ind India TMT group uh, in India. So uh, the calibration system, what are the requirements of the calibration system? The, the calibration system should be able to do the flat fielding and wavelength calibration over the full wavelength range. 
uh, it should uh, the it should provide a uniform signal uh, for uh, both in the blue and red channels. Uh, the telescope be it should mimic the telescope beam and uniformly illuminate the slit mask. Um, and the maximum exposure times are something like 10 seconds uh, for the spectroscopic flat fields. And for wavelength calibration, we can go up to one to two minutes. So, uh, and all of this should be able to fit in the allotted space for WFOS. So uh, the design is something like uh, the integrating sphere, which will, um, um, which will provide 99% uh, uniform light at its exit port. It's a 1.5 meter integrating sphere. The port size is about 400 millimeter. This uh, port, uh, uh, this light will be folded using a fold mirror and will hit a projection lens. The whole system is a projection lens system. It's not an imaging optics. Uh, this projection uh, projects the light onto the slit mask uh, after passing the M4 system. So at the slit mask, we expect uniform illumination. And this is uh, the uniform illumination what we could get with the throughput of about 34% only from the whole of the system. Majority of the absorption happens with the projection lens. Uh, though there is a variation of about 4% from end to end along the slit direction, uh, uh, the, the RMS variation within is about less than 1%. So this is a, a, as uniform as possible. There are low frequency um, uh, variations, but uh, the RMS is less than 1%. So uh, in, the, in the upcoming phases, we will work on it. We will see why this absorption of 4% is happening. We think it is because of the projection lens system and uh, we are going to work out how to, uh, how to minimize this absorption. The spectrometer subsystems itself, uh, there are several subsystems, collimators, uh, dichroc and folds, and gratings and exchanger, camera barrels, a filter exchanger, detector and cryostat system and camera rotation system. Coming to the collimators and dichroics, I will just go very quickly. So the collimators are the most complex uh, system uh, in the WFOS. These are new uh, mirrors with uh, freeform optics, which is having uh, one of the free, uh, mirror is a freeform optics and the other is aspheric. Uh, so uh, the sizes of these mirrors are about 1.5 uh, by uh, 1.5 meter by 0.8 meter. Um, so uh, the, the uh, team is looking at how to uh, coat these mirrors, these large mirrors. And uh, well, the team leading it is in Nanjing, NIAOT uh, in China. We, they have uh, come up with uh, gold coating, which they are going to get about 98% uh, um, reflectivity using the gold coating. Uh, the dichroic uh, is also a um, um, ma major instrument. So here I give the uh, performance of the dichroic system, which is almost 98% uh, here. So the WFOS optical design, uh, uh, the, main, uh, the main component of the WFOS optical design is the gratings. Uh, we are going to use a new uh, VPH uh, volume phase holographic gratings and uh, 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 volume binary gratings. This is nothing but the fused sil uh, silica uh, etched gratings. These are uh, transmissive, uh, uh, these form the transmissive optics. The transmission efficiency is pretty high with the VPH and VBG gratings, and which you can see it gives up almost like 80%. Uh, uh, the VPH gives an 80% efficiency, while uh, the VBG give, can give as high as almost 100% uh, uh, efficiency. So, um, so uh, um, after the gratings, we get into the spectrograph mechanisms. So uh, the transmissive uh, uh, gratings are important because uh, we get a very high uh, diffraction efficiency. So uh, what is the outcome of that is that it makes the mechanisms uh, very uh, uh, mechanisms quite complex, quite challenging. So uh, the, the India TMT team is looking at the grating exchanger system and camera rotation system. These are mechanical components, uh, basically, to uh, see how the gratings, a set of uh, several gratings can be exchanged uh, for every set of observations in a very stipulated time of less than 120 seconds. So, uh, and these cameras are also articulated basically. 
uh, uh, to achieve several resolutions from R is equal to uh, 1,500 to uh, 5,000, this camera, uh, this, uh, uh, camera has to be articulated. The camera basically holds uh, the camera barrel, filter exchange system, and the detector cryostat. And what you see here, hello? Yeah, what you see here is a uh, um, camera rotation uh, subsystem over here. Both of these things are led by um, uh, India TMT. So as you can see here, uh, uh, one of our uh, mechanical engineers has provided us how this uh, grating exchange happens. So at, uh, uh, for each uh, set of uh, observations or each set of resolutions, we, we will have a different set of ratings and that can be exchanged uh, using uh, uh, a smart mechanism some, uh, or something like this, which is shown over here. Uh, so the, um, uh, the camera rotation system, as you will see, has to move uh, very accurately, position itself, and the repeatability should be less than five arc seconds. So you can see the camera rotation system here, how it is moving and positioning itself. The accuracy should be uh, uh, five arc seconds. Positional accuracy could be like a little loose, but repeatability should be five arc seconds. So the grating moves uh, between zero to 50 degree while uh, the uh, camera rotation system moves to two theta, two times that of the uh, grating angle. So um, that is about the grating exchanger system. So we have the filter exchanger also, the filters here, are the broadband filters uh, at the focus, at the camera focus, so uh, at the focusing beam. Uh, so uh, there are uh, two sets of filters uh, in the blue and three sets of filters or four sets of filters in the red, which are listed over here. And uh, the both the systems will be identical except for a um, additional cell in the uh, red, uh, in the red channel, as you can see over here. So, yes. Moving on. So, what are, uh, so what does all this mean? I'm coming to the W fast focal plane uh, layout. So, at the telescope focal plane, you can see that the ADC corrects for a nine arc minute field of view. The size uh, uh, field of view is about 8.3 by 3 arc minute. And I, as I mentioned to you, on the adjacent sides of the uh, science field, you have the ADC, um, uh, the guiding system, the four guider systems, um, which patrols about 3.5 arc minute field. And uh, the camera is about one arc minute wide, uh, but the guide box is about five arc seconds. So uh, when it uh, transforms in, at the detector, the uh, the objects placed uh, here gets dispersed in, in uh, this direction along uh, 240 millimeter by about 200, 200 millimeter across. Ramya, you have three minutes left. Yeah, I'm finishing. So the end-to-end -end throughput of uh, the ADA of the WFOS is very good. The required, uh, the TMT requirement was about 30% uh, from 3,500 to 9,000. But since uh, uh, we, uh, we are going to use the VPH and VBG gratings, the uh, throughput of the whole system from ADC to detector is about uh, easily about 70% um, in, in, in uh, most of the uh, uh, resolutions. So uh, that is what I show here. So uh, W4 system is a very versatile system. You can have all in all 36 various settings to achieve your science goal. And uh, each of these settings is noted over here. So uh, basically the blue uh, 1500 uh, resolution and the red 1500 uh, resolution at 0.75 arc seconds will give uh, the full wavelength coverage from 3100 to 10,000 angstroms. And uh, uh, depending if we reduce the slit width uh, to 0.5 and 0.25 arc seconds, we will be able to achieve a resolution of 15,000 uh, 15, in uh, blue and red. So this uh, 0.25 arc second slit will be uh, um, a very um, uh, uh, very interesting when uh, GLAO becomes uh, uh, available at the TMT. 
Another important uh, uh, aspect of India TMT's contribution is the software. The entire software of uh, WFOS is being done at India TMT. The software is the software is not uh, um, uh, is, is not a, a, a simple design. It has to uh, adhere to the it has to adhere to the TMT architecture, which is uh, based on five principal systems here. And the five principal systems will talk only using a, a, a communication backbone, which is called the common software. The most of the subsystems of the software, TMT software is being developed by India and WFOS is an important contribution in it. So it's a hierarchical architecture. So the user will only see this top layer and uh, uh, the, the user inputs will be converted into a form of a set of sequences, will the, which will then be uh, sent into each of the assemblies. So assemblies, we can uh, uh, see it as the WFOS subsystems. Uh, this is the assembly layer, and you can see it as the, the WFOS subsystems. And finally, the assembly layers will send commands uh, through, uh, uh, through it, uh, hardware control demons to the uh, hardware. So uh, this was some, uh, 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 yeah, this we are trying to develop at, uh, at uh, ITCC. Um, Yet another important contribution is the complete electronics development of the WFOS system. So uh, this is being led by Kumar of uh, Aries. Uh, so he has proposed uh, the uh, master-slave architecture for the WFOS subsystem, where um, all the hardware control demons will contact the master uh, motion controller, which will send commands to the master motion controller. And this master motion controller will dispatch the commands to the respective uh, uh, slave controllers or respective hardware, uh, which will then move the hardware. So I won't go into the details of this because of the lack of the uh, uh, time. So uh, there are several uh, core science cases. Uh, uh, I'll be finishing in a minute. Uh, so the important ones are here, the evolution of uh, proto galaxies at Z is equal to two to, two to six, and in, it's interplay with the gaseous environment. Uh, basically, IgM tomography, instead of using only quasars, you can use a lot of star forming galaxies now, which is able to be observed through uh, uh, WFOS. The origin and properties of uh, stellar populations in nearby galaxies. Uh, basically, you can study the planetary nebulae and H2 regions by uh, placing multiple slates across. And uh, this is uh, the science field of view, and how the spectra will be dispersed is also displayed over here with uh, uh, 200 by uh, 140 by uh, 200 uh, millimeters. Uh, detector size. Uh, galaxy quenching mechanisms, one has to understand. Uh, so this low mass so galaxies, how do they quench in the cluster environment is one of the important science cases. Transient phenomena. Uh, so uh, we need to observe uh, very faint uh, gamma ray, uh, uh, gravitation wave sources, GRVs uh, and many more, which are unknown to us right now. And also be able to do a transient study of the solar system of objects. And uh, yet another important aspect is also the exoplanet atmospheres. I, I have no time to go into the detail of that, but I am not an expert as well. I stop here and I uh, thank you for your attention and uh, we'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, Ramyan. So we have uh, time for a couple of questions. So maybe somebody can coordinate from the conference hall. Uh, and first we'll go to the questions from the uh, in-person. And meanwhile, if you have any question, please raise your hand. So I don't see any question. Maybe uh, Ramya, I have a short question. So what is the main advantage of using uh, VHP gratings? These are uh, transmissive gratings. Uh, generally, people have been using the reflection uh, kind of gratings. And these make the system very large, very huge. But with the transmissive uh, kind of grating and also the litro mode, uh, we can make the uh, whole system compact. So that is one of the important uh, 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 important advantage 
Also, uh, the as I mentioned to you, the diffraction efficiency is pretty high. Uh, with reflection and gratings, we cannot get that much, but with PPH and BBGs, we are able to reach about uh, 60 to uh, yeah, 80% efficient. Okay, so there is a question from Gaurav. So Gaurav, unmute yourself and uh, ask. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for the great, great talk. It was uh, really uh, cool to hear all the great work that you have been doing. Uh, I had a few, a, a couple of uh, very uh, quick questions. Uh, first was, uh, I might have missed it, but what what's the typical magnitude that uh, WFOS can reach? Um, and the other question is that you mentioned that it is able to achieve a throughput of about 34%. Uh, being new to this field, I'm not 100% sure if that is uh, uh, enough, although you did mention that 30% was the requirement. But uh, I was just wondering what is the main bottleneck in achieving a better throughput than that? Uh, yeah, uh, if we can answer that. Uh, probably I would have uh, missed saying that. Thanks for uh, bringing it. So, uh, I, yeah, um, the signal to noise of uh, five can be achieved for uh, 32 magnitude uh, uh, galaxies, uh, uh, 32 magnitude in a span of about uh, um, five to 10 minutes. That's the kind of range. And for uh, a spectroscopy, uh, if we are looking at emission lines at 10 to the minus, uh, emission lines with a flux of 10 to the minus 20 Earths per centimeter square per second, which is right now uh, very hard to get, uh, that can be achieved in one hour exposure in the, uh, using the WFOS. That is uh, one of the questions. Uh, um, uh, the second question was uh, the throughput, uh, what I mentioned is of the calibration system that is uh, giving like the 34%, but uh, of the whole WFOS as such, it is uh, about uh, 60 to 70% throughput. What I talked about 34% throughput is of the integrating sphere, uh, which gives out uniform illumination at the slit mask um, is, is, is less because of the uh, projection. Uh, we have a lot of absorption because of the projection lens. All right, thanks. Uh, hi, Ravindo. We lost you for a second here, but we have a question from the offline system. Actually. Okay, please go on. Yeah, quickly. Yeah. Uh, I have a rather naive I'm question. Uh, so, my question is um, uh, in the WFOS, uh, uh, the of two channels are rare in the blue and around 500 uh, to 400 angstroms, that, that is where the division occurs. But I think there's an overlap between the two channels. Why is that? Like, is the dichroic not perfect? Uh, like, uh, I don't know any instrumentation, so it's a very naive question. Uh, why is that? Uh, why is there no sharp cutoff? And uh, if that is the case, like, is there like uh, some flux which will be in both the channels, which may reduce the noise in those uh, ends of the in the uh, Ramya, I didn't question. hear the full part of the question, uh, but I think it was uh, regarding uh, the dichroics. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Can, uh, can, should I repeat the question? Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, at. Um, Ramya, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was that, uh, I mean, the dichroic, you have a cutoff of uh, roughly 5400, and uh, there is an overlap between the two uh, regions. So the question was that, uh, why is it that there's no sharp cutoff, and why is there an overlap? And this is a student, so I think you want to explain. Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. So question is by a student, so you might need to explain it a little bit. Yeah, so um, uh, actually, I have no answer for this. Uh, I have no detailed answer for this. But uh, the team is looking at uh, 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 um, overlap regions between 540 to 570 nanometers for the same reason that uh, uh, the dichroic cutoff is very sharp at that uh, location. 
so I I don't know. Probably in the next phase there will be a detailed study about uh, how to um, um, yeah better this uh, 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 cutoff at that five fifty cutoff. Just I'm not sure I could answer this. So, okay, uh, maybe we can have offline discussions on that. So uh, now moving moving on to the next talk. Uh, next talk is by Professor Annapurni Subramanian from IA Bangalore. And it's going to be on Indian Spectroscopic and Imaging Space Telescope, INSIST. So it's going to be an overview and update. So yes, Professor Subraman. Yeah, thanks, Ravi. Um, so I, I can uh, talk, talk to for about, about 12 minutes and then keep to you. Yeah, minutes. 12 minutes and I'll let you know after three minutes. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, talk on Indian Spectroscopic and Imaging Space Telescope. Uh, an overview and update. Uh, we, this is the proposed submission uh, leveraging on the expertise of and success of UBIT. And these are our team, uh, uh, large collaboration from the nation as well as international partner from CSA, who is also a partner uh, for UBIT. So the question was that the UV imaging telescope on board AstroSat was launched on uh, September 28th, uh, 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 2015, and uh, so what is next? We learned a lot about it, and uh, we uh, made infrastructure uh, like the MGK One in Space Sciences Lab, and uh, we also have uh, people trained in uh, doing the instrumentation as well as use of science as well as operations. Uh, so all these, uh, once you have a successful mission, you start planning for the next one immediately. So. Uh, following the uh, this, what is next? So uh, I will give the. Uh, I mean, I I hope my screen is visible without any block, right? Yeah, it's it is good. Yeah. Okay. All no right. Problem. So uh, I just want to put everything in one uh, slide so that you get an uh, overview of where it started and what is the status now. See, origin of the proposal one traces back to the first UV science meeting um, uh, held at IEA in July two thousand seventeen. And there, that that uh, science meeting had a session on future plans, and uh, a baseline proposal was submitted uh, and presented in the meeting, which basically looked for much better spatial resolution than what you could give UVIT could give, and also capability for spectroscopy. That is the uh, main, uh, the bottom line of that proposal. And uh, since we started working on it, uh, there was a future astronomy. Uh, a mission call for proposal from ISRO in January 2018, and we submitted a proposal based on this uh, a requirement um, in April 2018. And the proposal was uh, reviewed by a subcommittee of uh, uh, then uh, ADCOIS, and uh, the committee recommended for a seed funding, and uh, the funding started in March 2019. But uh, by that time, we have been working at least uh, two years on various aspects of it, starting from collecting the science requirements, converting the science requirements into uh, specifications, instrument specifications, and uh, uh, some baseline design, optical as well as mechanical design, and the requirements to meet the uh, science uh, requirements. Basically, you know, how you convert the science in science requirements into instrument and which is feasible as well. Uh, so uh, we started identifying certain areas, certain um, uh, aspects of this particular proposal, which are of critical nature and uh, started uh, um, kind of demonstrating it. And that was the main aspect of the pre-project phase, which started in May, 2019. Uh, I also should mention that by the, uh, by the time or a few years before that itself, there was a mission from CSA under the name Castor, which was proposed, which is basically a kind of wider field uh, uh, imaging mission, um, which didn't have any spectroscopic component to it, but they also felt that the imaging component of INSIST and CASTER could be combined together and wanted to have a joint discussion so that you know science uh, requirements align together. So this joint um, uh, uh, meeting of these two uh, proposed missions happened in IEA in September, 2019, where we all we had the national team for INSIST present. And uh, we discussed with the team and uh, kind of felt that the optical design could be uh, um, combined. And we came up with an, a joint optical design. And we also started talking about the uh, work share, which could be 
is shared so that uh, the responsibilities can be shared so that you, you could look for a joint mission. We also identified Indian collaborators, uh, that is the joint institutions, roles and responsibilities, and the science team as well. And we developed the India, in India Canada work share document by November 2020. We had a CSA ISRO INSIS cast a joint meeting a year ago, which actually kind of uh, said that uh, uh, in, uh, in principle, we look forward to a joint mission. Uh, for the, that, there were also certain letters which has been uh, written by CSA to ISRO and replies from ISRO uh, in an encouraging way, looking forward to a, a joint mission. And uh, in, to take care of the community, we had several uh, uh, presentations and various meetings. Also, there was a one-day workshop conducted at the last ASI meeting. And this ASI meeting as well, we have this talk as well as a few posters. And during the pre-project phase, the, the, uh, the, 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 the proposal or rather the insist was uh, reviewed four times and all the four reviews, we uh, kind of progressed well. And the fourth review recommended that the, uh, the, the, the proposal is matured enough to move to the phase A uh, very soon. And we look forward to moving to this phase. And in a couple of months, we are trying to put together a, a, a consolidated document uh, submitting for uh, submitted, submitting to ISRO. And uh, we also did sub submit a consolidated document of all the activities performed till uh, September already. So the, the recommendation comes from that particular document. Uh, so in, in, in summary, the, uh, the, it's a one meter uh, mirror in a, a, a basically a, a TMA design. It's an off axis design. Um, we expect the spatial res resolution to be about 0.2 arc seconds. And the wavelength coverage is 150 to 550 nanometer divided into three UV, U and G channels. They observe simultaneously. And uh, photometry is done three, two, through these channels. These three channels, sorry, these two channels will have a slitless spectroscopy component through a prism. The G will be dedicated for uh, uh, fine guiding, and that will achieve this 0.2 arc second. So FSM, which is a fine sensing mirror and a fine guiding system, which is uh, one of the uh, important components of this mission, which will give you this um, high spatial resolution. And the optical design is in such a way that you get a, a kind of a half a degree field of view. So large imaging can be carried out. And this is the uh, sensitivity over here. And uh, as I mentioned, this little spectroscopy in these two channels, the resolution being about uh, 500. We also will have a smaller field with this, this field size, which is equal to the, uh, the uh, HST field of view to have a multi-object spectroscopy capability with uh, about uh, up to 200 objects with a resolution of uh, uh, 2000 and uh, sensitivity of this. The detailed mechanical aspects of this can be found in this particular um, uh, poster. Moving forward, how does it look in the image uh, in, in the sky on the sky? So you have this uh, uh, TMA mirror assembly uh, giving the uh, output, the beam. It, it goes to G, it goes to uh, UV, uh, sorry, U and the UV. And uh, so this is simultaneous and the side field goes to the UV uh, a spectrograph, another field goes to a, a, a G-band imager. So on the sky, it looked like this. These three, this particular red uh, square is uh, imaged simultaneously. Um, and G-band is used for the FSM, the uh, 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 guiding basically, fine sense guide, guiding. This is the G-band precision photometry. And this is the MO, or the multi-object spectrograph. So what it in principle will do is that if you want to take the multi-object spectra, uh, spectra of the n number of objects you see in the center of this galaxy, you place this over here, but then all the fields are imaged simultaneously in whichever mode you choose. Now, this is coming from various documents out here. And uh, you can also see the signs which are projected for this in this particular uh, post, uh, more details over here, including these simulations. These, this particular slide, uh, picture uh, compares the a uh, later field of view of the HST UVIT in system galax. We also have this uh, niche uh, object, uh, the uh, instrument, the multi-object spectrograph, which is actually sampling at about uh, 0.2 arc second over 10 micron. 
So it is impossible to have a visible slit over there. So this is carried out by a multi, sorry, DMD, which is a digital micromirror device. And this is position, this is like this, and only those uh, mirrorlets will be flipped which would direct the light to a spectrograph and you will get this multi-object spectra. So the object selection in one direction and dispersion in the other direction. So uh, development and design and development of the DMD controller is happening and that you can see in this poster and the DMD based MOS design can be seen in the poster by Sriram. So please look, look for the details over there. And we have uh, different science cases led by different uh, people from various institutions. And these are put together in a comprehensive document, science document. And uh, these are partner institutions coming over there. And uh, the uh, uh, again, you can see many of them, many of the simulations, many of the uh, um, um, how the idea, how what what can be achieved using this um, uh, this mission are put put together here. The science document is getting ready and also to be submitted for publication. Uh, with respect to Castor, while joining, uh, uh, while moving to a, moving forward together, the updates is that the the long range plan, which is which the Canada does every, just it is similar to the Decadal uh, plan by the U.S. So the Castor is given the highest prefer preference in the priority in the in LRP to 2020, and uh, based on that, the CSA actually started an SDGP study on the wide field astronomical imaging. Uh, uh, UV optical critical technologies that is already ongoing and uh, IA is participating in the uh, meetings with respect to this particular uh, um, activity. Recently, Castor uh, moved to uh, phase zero, which is equivalent to phase A over here. And the kickstart uh, of the uh, phase zero studies happened uh, earlier this month. They have two types of studies. One is for the industry, the other is for the science. And the science uh, study uh, started on 24th March. Many of the team members of INSYST are part of the study. And we had a, a telecon uh, kickstarting this on 24th and various aspects were uh, given. And this is about uh, um, a more than a year long study and uh, monthly meetings and various activities are planned. And uh, that's all from my side, thank you. So. Summary is that we look forward to going to the uh, phase A in the next few months so that uh, uh, we uh, move uh, similar to Castor and uh, start on with the project. And from T0, we expect the completion to be in about six years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, that was well on time. So we have time for a couple of questions. So please, you can raise your hand and somebody from the hall can also coordinate. Yeah, I don't think we have any questions from here. Okay. I will wait for a few more seconds. Okay, we have one question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Mr. that was a very nice talk, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about how this uh, collaboration with the Can uh, Canadian Space Agency and JPL would work. Uh, is there any thought about how time would be divided or whether there would be one you know, uh, time, time allocation committee or multiple or what the modalities are of observing with uh, INSYST? Or is that too far in the future? Yeah, that is right. Uh, we're just starting it and then we are working on the modalities of even to make the instrument first and then also uh, talking about basically this is multi mode and also uh, 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 like I we were also talking about you know surveys versus target uh, based uh, uh, programs so various modes have to be evaluated so that is why they have they have put together various science teams we also have to go through that process to actually prioritize and also make the best use of what the instrument is out there. So that priority will come and the time share, time share based on the work share will also has to be discussed. So uh, it's uh, uh, it, it'll happen sometime, but it's too early to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, I had one, quick, uh, one more quick question. Uh, in your mind, uh, what is sort of the transient response time of insist for transients? Is it, is it like swift where it can rapidly slew to another target or uh, will it have a more uh, you know, planned uh, uh, plan 
hand observation like hubble or something yeah it would more like a hubble one because this is not a uh, transient uh, uh, um, like the objective is are the transient study is not the main objective of this mission so the uh, uh, there would be response but that needs to be worked out with mission etc okay thank you so uh, i don't see any other question from the online audience so uh, let me thank professor anupurni once more now moving on to the next talk uh, the next talk is by amruta lakshmi and she is going to talk on uh, thermal design and simulation of the payload and it's going to be in person talk so please go ahead जस्ट आज कर आई होप आई एम ऑडिबल एंड माई स्लाइड अवेज यस Not audible for the offline audience. Uh, you are audible to the online audience, and please go ahead. I don't know what. <laughs> Maybe just like try speaking a little bit louder. <laughs> yeah. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. I am Amrita Lakshmi Vadladi, a fourth-year undergraduate in the Aerospace Department at IIT Bombay. Today, I'll be talking about Daksha satellite. It is a proposed collaboration by IIT Bombay, IUCA, RRI, TIFR, and of course, we have a great support and and seed funding from ISRO. Today, I'll today my talk is going to be specific about the thermal design and simulations of the payload of Daksha satellite. Let me start by introducing you to Daksha. Daksha is a proposed mission for detecting high energy counterparts to gravitational wave sources. It is going to be an order of magnitude more sensitive than any existing mission. The Daksha satellite is essentially two satellites in lower equatorial orbits, similar to that of AstroSat, for full sky coverage. It is going to be equipped with three detect three set of detectors. First, the low energy detectors, the silicon drift detectors, which were prior used in Chandrayaan. Next, we have the medium energy detectors, the cadmium zinc tel uh, telluride detectors, which were used in the AstroSat mission. And the third, we have the high energy scintillators sitting on the center of the payload. So essentially, we are building upon the legacy of already successful missions. Now, about the radiator plate, which I'll be talking about in the later slide, is in the red. The payload is sitting on the bus in the yellow. Let me talk about the vital statistics of Daksha. Daksha has a broadband energy range covering from one kilo electro volt to greater than one mega electric volt. That is essentially covering the soft ray X rays to all the way to the hard ray X ray re ranges. The medium effective area of Daksha is going to be close to around thirteen centimeter square per single per satellite, and both the satellites combined, it's going to be around seventeen hundred centimeter square. The sky coverage of Daksha, it, both the satellites combined, will be close to eighty percent, which is uh, opposed to a single satellite in any low Earth orbit. Which, which is close to fifty percent. The onboard computation on Daksha is going to ensure that we receive an event alert within less than less than one minute. Also, the down we are going to downlink all the even more data for our offline search for for any offline searches possible and better sensitivity analysis. Now, let me give you a viewpoint of Daksha science before I jump into the instrumentation part. So, as I spoke of, the Daksha is looking for electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave sources. Next, we will also be looking for gamma ray bursts. Daksha will detect the highest redshift uh, redshift uh, GRVs. Talking about other sciences, we are also looking for transients, such as the uh, fast ray, uh, the FRBs, and the pulsars. Let me now introduce you to the concept of why do we require a thermal subsystem for the Daksha mission, and for uh, and for that matter, any uh, any satellite mission, specific to the Daksha mission. We have a very high heat dissipation, close to 660 watts, which are by the detectors on the satellite surface. 
along with orbital heat loads, which constitute the sun, the solar heat load, which is, which, uh, which is around 1350 watts. Then we have the Earth IR, which is around 230 watts. And along with that, we have the albedo, which, which is around 30% of the solar. This together itself constitutes to around 1800 watts. So, and there are some hard requirements coming from the detectors on board. That is, it can only function efficiently within a range of 0 to 20 degrees Celsius. We also have another hard requirement that the temperature gradients within the detector plates and across should be less than 10 degrees. Adding to that, we cannot afford for extreme heat loading in an orbit because this would result in thermostructural strains and fatigue, which the satellite might not be able to endure. Next, I would like to introduce you to the thermal design process that we have undertaken for the Daksha mission and which any satellite mission can look into for their particular uh, mission gap. Starting with, we require the inputs that involves the geometry of the satellite, the mission profile, the heat loads, and the surface finishes and contacts corresponding to that satellite. With these inputs, we compute the heat fluxes and the temperatures for, with, uh, with the heat balance uh, in mind. These computed heat fluxes and temperatures are then compared with the existing, with the requirements that are imposed, uh, which are specific to any mission, which constitutes of the average limits, the local limits, and gradients. After the comparison, we come up with thermal elements. We add these thermal elements or modify accordingly, and then also change parameters like areas and coatings, which takes care of the emissivities and absorptivities. And again, we compute the heat fluxes and temperatures with these added thermal elements. So essentially, it's an iterative design process. So now, since I introduced you to the thermal design process, let me introduce you, let me tell you about the challenges that, are, that we need to keep in mind from a thermal perspective. Starting with, let us look at a cube which is of similar size, which is of a similar size of that of Daksha. If I simply put that cube without any thermal control in a low Earth orbit, with the uh, with the uh, similar uh, internal heat loading as well as the orbiting heat loading, what we will see is the temperatures will shoot to close to 400 degrees Celsius, as seen in the plot and the representation as well. So, without any thermal control, we cannot have a satellite in any orbit. So. The onboard, uh, the onboard, uh, even the onboard electronics will have a particular range, which is definitely less than this. And talking about orbits, let me also introduce you to another crucial step of the thermal design process, that is choosing an orbit. How impactful it is for us to choose the correct orbit for a design, for, for a mission. So for in, the, uh, in the case of Daksha, initially we thought of an anti-Earth orbit. The representation of the same is as follows. Essentially, the uh, both the dome surfaces that is a payload is face is facing opposite to the uh, is facing away from the earth this is favorable from the science perspective but when you look at the instrumentation part that is the thermal perspective the temperatures would have shot to close to 129 degrees which is not desirable again so we had to switch to an anti sun orbit the representation of the same is as follows where uh, the base plates of both the satellites are facing towards the sun vector here the temperatures are drastically fallen from 129 to 132 close to 15 degrees so the crux being, this is how crucial each and every step in the design process is. So moving on to more challenges that we had, uh, that we had taken care of, I would like to, I would like to uh, directly show you the current thermal design that we have come up with, starting with a simple CAD model uh, that is relevant to our thermal perspective. So this is the payload, the dome structure, along with the bus. If you want to look at uh, the exact CAD model with just the payload, this is how it looks. Looking at a closer view of the heat pipe configuration, this is what we have come up with for, uh, so far. The following is an animation representing the uh, time evolution of the payload temperatures. The key takeaway being the following: that the payload temperatures have uh, uh, are in the uh, the payload temperatures are as follows. The satellite will have a minimum temperature of around minus seven degrees and a maximum temperature of around eleven degrees. And the average temperature of the satellite from the uh, uh, from the current thermal design is, pr is predicted to be around zero degrees Celsius, which is which was which is what we desired from the initial objectives that I spoke of. Second, looking at the secondly looking at the closer view of the detector plates, uh, this is how this is how the temperature variation and the gradients would be for the ME boxes, which uh, which are the ME detector boxes. So uh, we wanted a temp we wanted a temperature gradient to be less than ten degrees, and we have achieved the same as well with the current uh, thermal design. So combining both these results, we can confidently say that the temperatures of the detector plates are predicted to be in the range from seven to sixteen degrees. Moving on to the heat transfer in the whole satellite. So initially, if there was no thermal control, 
And if we just had the satellite with all these orbital heat loads in the um, in uh, all, all this orbit, orbital heat loads as well as the internal heat loads, this is how the temperatures would have been close to 400 degrees. But now with the thermal control, we can see the temperatures have fallen to close to zero degrees and the gradients are also as expected. So I would like to conclude by saying that an optimum thermal design for the mission is proposed, including thermal elements, heat pipes, radiator plates, surface coatings and MLIs that we have exposed so far. And our objectives that we had in mind before were as follows that having the temperature range, uh, having the average temperature of the payload close to zero degrees, we have achieved it. And also the temperature gradients within the radiator plate are also less than 10 degrees. And from the structural point of view, we are also uh, simultaneously carrying out certain simulations and testing for the same. Speaking of structures, we also have some other posters that you people can check out for. There is a poster on Daksha structure simulations and payload. And these are the other Daksha posters that you all can look for in, the, in this conference. This is the current team. Um, we have some professors and some students, not all. But I'm glad to find familiar names and faces today in the conference. I would like to end by simply saying the future is bright. Thank you. Thanks, Amruta. I think that was uh, very well on time. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Please go back to the slide, second or third, and I lost the count. Uh, no, yeah, the fourth slide. Uh, yes. So here, basically, the, the satellite is oriented towards uh, detecting gamma ray bursts and everything that goes on in a high energy. Okay, so maybe in the orders of T. Or any, right? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. So, uh, what exactly the event alerts are you suggesting that it would give? What exact events in such high energy scale would it give? Yeah. So, this is about the Daksha science part. Um, I would say that. Uh, can you see the slide? Yeah. Yeah. So, the gamma ray bus, maybe? I'm not sure about uh, the science part of it. But I think uh, the main the main aim of Daksha is to uh, identify gamma ray bursts, uh, especially yeah. the ones arising from uh, binary neutron star mergers, so which are short GRPs, yeah, so and true. also high redshift GRPs that it's right mentioned. And the alert is basically telling people, telling the astronomy community that there has been a gamma ray burst in this direction with these properties, uh, so that other telescopes can follow them. But the variability is in the variability of the gamma ray bursts also. Uh, can be taken in. Is it, like, uh, my, my point is, is one minute too large use or time? Can be. Right. So there are a, you, a lot of these uh, events have afterglows which last, last for many uh, minutes to hours to days. And so the aim is to follow these afterglows. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I had another, uh, I had a question. Uh, so you showed this uh, design where, you know, it is very. Uh, it is accounting for the heat load uh, created by Daksha. But so, does this account for uh, the heat generated in the spacecraft burst itself? Does ISRO give some specifications on what, how much heat is going to be generated by the spacecraft and what temperature should be maintained in the burst? Right. So, uh, or current, do they have their own sort of separate thing? Right. Yeah. So the uh, ISRO, the, the ISRO has told us that consider the burst to be a black box and then only consider the payload temperatures. That is what we are supposed to cater for. And the bus is just coming into picture for our purpose, only the structural aspect, just the mass and the structural integrity should be maintained. That's it. No, uh, nothing on the front of thermal to be considered. But there, there won't be any conduction through the contact points? Or is it... Right. So uh, we have the radiator plate. If I'll just show you the... Yeah. So what the ISRO has told us so far is the bus, anything the bus is generating is going to be taken care of by the radiator plate. And it will also have an internal... Um, it will it will have its own thermal control as well. So something not we are something not we are very sure about. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Amruta. We don't have any question from the online uh, participants. So we now go to the next talk, and that is by Ruta Kale from NCR Pune, and Ruta is going to talk about capture.
interferometric data analysis pipeline for the upgraded GMRT. So Ruta, go ahead and share your screen. It's going to be an online talk. I'll remind you once you have three minutes left. Yeah, thank you. I will start now. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Um, I, I would like to thank ASI for uh, giving me this opportunity to give this talk today. Um, so I'm going to talk about CAPTURE, which is an interferometric data analysis uh, that we are developing for the upgraded GMRT. Um, uh, I have mentioned the uh, team members over here. Uh, primarily, I and uh, Manisha Samre, who is my colleague at GMRT, are the ones primarily developing the code itself. But we are taking the strategy for calibration, and uh, other contributors are uh, contributions regarding testing um, out the pipeline, etc., from the rest of the team. So I'll be talking about the continuum uh, imaging with the upgraded GMRT and why we need a pipeline for that, and then come to the current. Um, uh, current status of uh, the capture pipeline and the polarization part that we have recently added and then basically tell about more about capture results and further planned developments in capture. So the upgraded GMRT as uh, most of you may be familiar but I will just uh, um, say it briefly. So upgraded GMRT is a SK Pathfinder telescope. Um, the main um, main uh, upgrade uh, in the context of continuum imaging was the uh, availability of a large instantaneous bandwidth of the order of 400 megahertz as compared to 33 megahertz with the earlier legacy system. So um, what uh, this implies is this large change in delta nu by nu um, as a function of frequency. And you can see these small uh, blue um, patches where um, it is plotted, this quantity is plotted for the G legacy uh, system and the pink ones are for the upgraded GMRT. So what this means is that um, in, at, um, uh, when we want to do continuum imaging, we are trying to use this entire bandwidth available in uh, each subband here uh, or the bands of GMRT named as band 2, 3, 4 and 5 in the increasing order of frequencies. We are trying to make one continuum image from this entire band and at the same time trying to uh, also extract spectral index information about uh, the sources uh, in the field of view as a function of uh, frequency within the uh, given wideband observation. So of course uh, the wide bandwidth has brought in uh, advantage in uh, improved RMS but it also makes a huge difference for the instantaneous UV coverage and um, basically, that is a huge boost for uh, imaging extended sources. So uh, other aspect is that the upgraded GMRT has uh, brought in huge uh, data volumes. Um, so typically where one was dealing with a couple of GB to a few GB of data uh, for a typical six, seven hour run with the legacy system, now we are dealing with hundreds of GB um, on a routine basis. So um, the increased data volumes and the requirement that uh, we need to analyze these uh, data on relatively modest systems and requires an automated approach. And that is how uh, the seed of this pipeline started. And now we have grown from that uh, to making it a fully uh, automated pipeline. So what is CAPTURE? So CAPTURE is uh, basically CASA pipeline come toolkit for upgraded GMRT data reduction. Uh, it has basically two main aspects, um, the pipeline part and the toolkit part. So the way it is uh, written is that one can make an end-to-end -end image, uh, continuum image uh, using the pipeline aspect. This has been very useful in uh, testing or commissioning new systems for the upgraded GMRT. And um, for example, the online RFI filtering and also having some regular data checks, et cetera. Uh, and while the uh, toolkit aspect goes into the way um, it has been, uh, uh, the pipeline has been structured, 
um, it is for customized usage and uh, giving flexibility for the user to intervene and add more steps or you know, uh, do more advanced analysis. And this also helps in radio astronomy training purposes where you want to actually simplify the analysis for the user. And uh, it also has the flexibility of, or provides the ease of further development. So I will quickly tell you about the released pipelines currently that are available on GitHub. And uh, you can reach that from the NCRA pages uh, given over here. So um, Capture CASA 6 is the current uh, pipeline that has been released. It is compatible with the uh, CASA versions, which are beyond 6. So CASA is basically common as astronomy software applications, which is developed by NRAO. And that provides the uh, basically the, uh, the uh, framework to analyze uh, interferometric data. And Capture has basically uh, put together all the CASA tasks into an automated pipeline, and we have used um, Python for that. Capture Pole is the uh, uh, version of uh, Capture, but it is uh, slightly different from Capture CASA 6 in terms of its calibration because of the inclusion of uh, polarization. Um, and that is also available on GitHub. In addition to these capture pipelines, another crucial aspect for obtaining images that are ready for science are the primary beam corrections. And these can be achieved by uh, tasks that we have written for uh, obtaining primary beam corrected images with the GMRT. So I will tell about these tasks in a bit. Another um, aspect I want to tell at the beginning is that we would like to keep uh, the development of uh, um, CASA, uh, of capture hand in hand with CASA. And recently, um, in the past year, uh, since the past year, we have representation on the CASA Users Committee, thanks to NRAO, and that is helping us to keep up with the development of uh, CASA. So, um, the main uh, thing that uh, CAPTCHA achieves is basically it starts from the updated GMRT interparametric data and does the operations of flagging calibration, imaging, and self calibration while producing diagnostic plots and flagging summary. Uh, and it produces an image of the sky. It could be just Stokes eye image if you have not observed the cross uh, or not saved the cross products of polarization, or you could produce a Stokes cube. This is a flowchart uh, giving you the details of each of these steps. But roughly, what I can tell you is that there uh, on the left you will see the input files, and the on the right the output files that are produced at various stages of uh, capture. And the first block on the left here is a calibration block uh, or uh, initial flagging plus calibration block. And on the right is the imaging block. So uh, primarily, uh, the user is interacting with the config file where the basic inputs are given along with the starting LTA or fits file, whichever, or, uh, is, or the measurement set, whatever may be the starting point for the analysis. And then uh, the, the settings are provided in the config file and then the pipeline operates based on those inputs. So these are the various stages at which uh, uh, the pipeline can be halted, the ones indicated by the uh, uh, file names on the left. So it can be halted at various stages of calibration and uh, the user can inspect the data. Or if uh, one is not happy with the uh, flagging, one may do additional flagging and then uh, again push the data into the pipeline for further processing and things like that. So there is a lot of flexibility on the user's side in the processing. So here on the imaging block, the main uh, aspect is self calibration where uh, continuum imaging users have uh, a lot of personal choices to make. And there are some inputs uh, that one has provided in the config file to control the self calibration. So polarization is a new aspect with the upgraded GMRT and that has been primarily developed by Preeti Karb and her group. Uh, and they have also published it um, in this uh, publications given over here. And we have basically implemented implemented that in the in capture, and that is what is capture pole. So here, the only change uh, in capture pole is that you need to uh, we we do the polarization calibration in this block. There are some caveats or uh, major caveats for the capture pole because um, uh, we do not have too many ca uh, characterized calibrators. Um, at the moment, capture pole is only available for band four data analysis and. Also, it works only on specific calibrators where we have information on their polarization angle as a function of the frequency. And at the moment, 3C286 and 3C138 are the polarized calibrator supported. 
so uh, quickly how to use capture kafka six uh, you need to basically download the codes from github and put them locally to your data and the, also uh, realize that that is the place where you also will get all the output and then the user modifies the config file and also i recommend that you read the caveats before uh, uh, setting the pipeline to run to avoid failures and then you basically run capture and then for science ready images you would need uh, primary beam correction so quick overview of the data sizes so to run capture you need uh, availability of uh, the, um, disk space which is um, uh, which i will tell roughly so here as an example if you start with 143 gb of uh, an lta file in converting it to measurement set the size has swelled to 322 gigabytes so at this point you may decide to um, delete these files the lta file will be available in the gmrt archive if you haven't um, had any special settings which requires you to save that file and the archivers will save it in a standard integration time and so on and then you basically the data size goes down as you uh, basically average the data according to the uh, needs of your science goal etc and you will also produce images uh, which are typically of the sizes of uh, 2 to 3 gb each you will produce about 8 to 10 images depending on your choice of uh, self calibration so i would uh, recommend that you have at least four times uh, the size of your lta file assuming that you will uh, delete the lta and fits files yourself the cap capture will not automatically do it um, and you would need uh, to keep that much space on your disk for it to accommodate all the uh, so typical run times uh, for capture uh, so for the imaging block that is where the main um, uh, run time is uh, you will take about 3 to 4 days uh, on a modest system like 32 gb ram and 8 cores uh, but with a better system you will do it uh, in 50 hours or so so this is an example for typical band 3 data set where you would want to make an image of uh, 7000 at least uh, pixels at least uh, with double projection planes of 600 to 1000 so ruta you have about 3 minutes left okay yeah thank you um again for making uh, the image science ready you need to correct for the primary beam gain this is basically the uh, gain plotted for the ugmrt primary beam parameters that are available currently and basically this uh, can be done through the task uh, tasks that we have uh, developed so these tasks are uh, ugmrt pb uh, which is casa con compatible tasks and has the most updated parameters Uh, wvpb gmrt is an earlier task which was uh, compatible with earlier casa version it continues to be available but i would uh, but the parameters have not been updated there has been a slight change in the parameters since uh, there are also higher order poly polynomials that we had implemented in that task so if anyone is interested could uh, try it but there are tests on going on this so there are several publications where we have used um, uh, capture for imaging extended sources like in clusters and also imaging uh, wide fields like deep fields uh, images where you mainly focus on uh, detecting uh, compact sources um, this is another example of a cluster where a relic was uh, imaged um, uh, at bands 3 and 4 and 5 and the rms achieved were uh, uh, pretty good Uh, we have also used it to image very wide uh, sources of uh, uh, large angular size sources like uh, nearby galaxies like ngc 4631 uh, this has also been used uh, to study a sample of quasars uh, and we are also ourselves uh, using it to image extended sources in clusters so more results are awaited so currently uh, pros of casa that it is doesn't depend on anything else except casa uh, you can run it end to end or in steps uh, but there are some cons like we have not tailored it for handling multiple targets or unusual calibrators uh, and you need to at least do primary beam correction and it lacks a little bit on soft sophistication and software aspects uh, quickly going over further development we would like to improve on the speed of casa uh, and improve the image quality uh, by uh, basically accounting for direction dependent effects in calibration uh we would also like to improve on the portability uh, by containerizing the pipeline like uh, for example in a docker so that uh, the primary beam correction and all the things can be ported all together uh, and so on and basically um, uh, i will go over this very quickly uh so in summary 
uh, these pipelines are um, available for use by the users. Uh, and we would like to get feedback from the community and we are constantly uh, uh, improving our pipeline based on that uh, so that we also learn about the needs of the users. And um, we also welcome participation in the development is if anyone would like to contribute to the pipeline. Um, and there are further tests and developments uh, ongoing to improve the speed and image quality. So um, please um, feel free to use Capture and please let me know your feedback. Or if you need any help, you could also write to me or on GitHub. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ruta. So we have time only for one quick question. Uh, if not, then we will move on to the next talk, the last talk for today's, and it's going to be by Shubhadeep Saha, and he's going to talk on design of phased radio array for cosmic ray detection. So Shubhadeep, you can share your, well, you are giving it in person, so go ahead. I will remind you uh, once you have three minutes left. Uh, can someone make, oh, I see. Okay, it's back. I can see the feed from the room, but uh, nothing is audible. Oh, maybe uh, somebody should unmute. Okay. Right. Uh, sir, right now you are the host, so like, uh, can you uh, please? Keep yes, yes. We are host, it's so already on. Okay. Go ahead. We actually had an internet blackout, and right now we are in Oppo Mobile. Let's go. Yeah, so I think we might have some like uh, slight uh, delays in the screen. Uh, or something so uh, please okay. yeah there is still uh, uh, can you see the screen yeah screen is visible but audio has some problem yeah go ahead Shubhadeep, yes, you can start. Uh, video. Yeah. Uh, is it audible, sir? Hello. Yes, yes, it's audible. Go ahead. So, good evening. Yes. Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm very pleased myself here, and I'm sure you, I'm from uh, at Kanpur, PhD uh, student of first year. And I've been working my PhD endeavor is concerned with designing of a phase radio array for cosmic detection. And I've been working with Professor Pankaj Jain and we in guest collaboration supervision of Professor Dave Besson as well from University of Kansas. So, just a minute. 
So cosmic rays are basically these, uh, I mean, highly energetic charged particles like beer nuclei varying from say proton like hydrogen nuclei to up uh, to a uh, Fe or iron nuclei. And these are very, these are, I mean, I mean, I mean arriving at uh, from uh, all possible direction, I mean, I stop it early. So what happens like uh, when this charged particle propagates through our atmosphere in a series of uh, interaction with the atmospheric constitu constituents, uh, it gives, uh, say, I mean, different variety of say secondary particles. Among these, all secondary particles, electrons and positrons in spatial, uh, being the slightest one in our geonomic field, they are being deflected significantly and thereby give rise to impulse pulses. And uh, what is our aim is to detect these pulses and from these pulses, we will do infer about the different, uh, I mean, uh, properties of the actual primary cosmic ray, which has generated this kind of shock. So uh, uh, let's have to, uh, a bit of more introduction before delving deeper into the topic. The only experiment in India is that the array of simulator detectors, and it is so designed to observe. I mean, okay, observe cosmic rays around the knee region. If you can see my pointer, this uh, broken part of the I mean, Paula spectrum is the knee region, and I mean, it, it is operating on an energy uh, range of say 10 to 13 to 10 to 16 electron volt roughly. And what is our present aim is to look into our facilitated observation in the transition region. Transition region is, I mean, roughly varies from 10 to 15 electron volt to 10 to 18 electron volt. Uh, if you can see the cursor, uh, I mean, okay, sorry. This is the region like uh, starting from the knee at the full step of ankle. So uh, what we are planning, we're planning to install some, uh, we're planning to install a radio uh, array, detector array. And uh, in the present demonstration, ordinary radio arrays like total of experiment at Nancy, France, and there's another one, Aira at Argentina. So these are the typical, I mean, ordinary radio arrays, and they have a typical uh, lower threshold at around 10 to the 6, 17 electron volt. However, we want to suppress this, uh, I mean, lower threshold further to a few tens of PEV, and that is why uh, initially Professor Dave Bresson envisaged to uh, use a uh, phased radio array instead of ordinary radio arrays, and that is what we are up to. But one thing has to be mentioned here is that uh, at our desired level of lower threshold, say if you of PEV, it is a region which is highly, I mean, noise contaminated zone. So this will create some problem for us. And as I mentioned, noise will be our prime foe and we have to deal it uh, totally in order to, I mean, effectively in order to select actual events over than fake events. And for that, we have come up with this kind of sort of multi-layer uh, triggering system where the first level is designated by number of hits. Uh, which has to be greater than or equal to four. Number of which means we, we have an array of, um, uh, say, radio array of 100 antennas, and within this 100 antennas, in a pertinent coincidence time window of, say, 100 nanoseconds, at least four of the antennas being hit. Then we say, okay, this, this could be an actual event, and they just go for the recording of the uh, event. And there could be another thing like the same level trigger. It, it, this is very much essential when, uh, say, we're looking, uh, uh, I mean, we are going beyond, uh, not beyond, going below 10 to 17 rectal volt. As I mentioned, this region is very much prone to high level of noise contamination. And that is why, uh, that I mean, that also results in sort of, say, a uh, high level of occurrence of fake events over actual events. So on the other way around, say, the existing simulator detector, uh, the existing simulator detector is best efficient in this region. So it would be uh, really supplementary and really essential if I can get, if we can get an external confirmation from the simulator data array that it is an actual event and go and report for the event. And the third level uh, trigger is very much important because it's a phase study and we are we ought to use it as a beam forming trigger, which is the following. Say. Uh, at around few tens of PUV, the noise level is high, so the SNR is basically has totally messed up, has got totally messed up. And that case, the radio detector array may not be quite capable of, I mean, recording that event. For that purpose, what may happen, like a second level trigger can also, I mean, can, I mean, of course, be generated. And on the basis of that, if we can record the data around the antennas and thereafter, we can perform a beam forming. And we know as after beam forming, the, effectively the SNR gets further improved by a square root of n factor so we can we may be able to be i mean capture that event 
So that is a sort of uh, added requirements we're having. I will uh, point out three or four, um, most of the lectures started and there is some science goal. It will be a dual band operation, like wide low frequency band uh, extending from 30 to 80 megahertz and wide high frequency band extending from 160 to 40 megahertz. And there is another, Another thing that I want to hear, I mean, being in your notice is that uh, area coverage, uh, at least 150 or 150 meter square has to be, I mean, initially covered. And number of antenna we are initially planning to have is like 150 or 100 dual plus antennas. So let's move on. Uh, so whenever we're dealing with such, uh, I mean, designing kind of thing, so uh, there could be two broader aspects we need to work on, we need to contemplate on. And these broad aspects are like engineering perspective and other one is a scientific goal. So let's talk about engineering perspective here. And it is a sort of negative simulation, I mean, numerical electrical simulation. And uh, so here I presented our present design, which is a sparse and irregular array spurs, uh, I mean, why do we choose a sparse nature is that uh, we have to cover an area of 150 plus 150 meters per and initially with 150 or 100 antennas. So that has been one of the reasons we have chosen a spurs uh, kind of, uh, I mean, I mean, array structure, array layout, layout. And other one is the uh, irregular, I mean, uh, thing. This is to suppress the getting low levels. Started with the designing, what was in my mind is to get low or side low levels. And you can see here in the following, I mean, uh, pattern, radiation pattern, the side low levels, which are in dark blue, this corresponds to almost minus 31 dB, whereas the, I mean, the main beam maximum is uh, somewhere around 26 dB. So thereby we can see we have already in our base design, we have already reduced this or suppressed this cyclope or getting low levels. And another thing is that getting low levels are some uh, some inherent characteristics of the array factor or the design of the array, not what kind of antennas that has been used. So one thing that might have uh, captured your notice, no, uh, sorry, your uh, attention is that uh, the beam pattern itself is not so smooth, which is very much required, but you see, I have plotted here, uh, I mean, sort of, uh, I have plotted here, sort of say, uh, I mean, array of simplest transfer antennas because of some uh, unavoidable constraints, I have to use this. And in, in our future, I mean, uh, simulations, I will try to uh, simulate with better, like uh, lock periodic kind of antennas. But uh, at this moment, we are facing some unavoidable problem in, in the simulation. So you see, uh, we have used this sort of, say, transfer antennas, which are never, I mean, preferred for, I mean, wideband operation, whereas we are looking for an ultra wideband operation. Once these antennas will be, uh, in, I mean, exchanged with this sort of, say, scale or log periodic dual porous antennas, I can assure that the performance of this array, at least in terms of beam pattern, main beam pattern, will be flourished further. So there is another aspect, as I mentioned, like scientific goals. So you have an array, it, it has a good beamform architecture, that's good, but we're not going to transmit or we're not going into a telecommunication. So there are few science goals that has to be, I mean, made during a, a by, by our design or array. So there is one of the quantity of our importance of figuring efficiency. I will not go into a formal definition. Let me give you some example to explain. So here you see, uh, I mean, for figuring efficiency, we will require to have a larger number of events. Uh, but here I have only presented a smaller number of events and I have presented in terms of figuring capability rather than efficiency. One means, yes, it will be triggered and zero means it will not be triggered. So let's uh, look at, First event and the third third event, both in the both cases, the A is one, it means mass number is one, it means it's a proton shower with 10 to the 17 electron volt. And you see the antennas, I mean, geometry is site of say constant mean, it's a square grid, or uh, where the nearest antennas are separated by 25 meters, or they're 25 meters separate. And in this case, it is a square grid again, but the nearest antennas are 50 meters apart. And you see number of antennas are 36 in both cases, but the event has been recognized by the first, I mean, kind of design, but not in the third kind of design. So this is essentially gives you an idea of what sort of maximum distance you can keep in between two anten consecutive antennas, apart from the beamforming architecture that you have to also fix. So let's look around. So 
fourth and the fifth event as well. It is 16 left over total shower and both the and both are identical events. And you see there is a variable octagonal kind of uh, say I mean uh, geometry or layout. With each step, we are I mean increasing the spacing between the uh, between two elements. So here we see we are using 100 full antennas, and here we are using 88 antennas, and both detector or both design the I mean the event will be recognized. Now the natural question that might pop in, pops in, in your mind is like, why shall we use 112 antennas when we can get it done by eight antennas? So the answer lies in the fact of triggering efficiency. Say we, if we have 100 of these kind of events, uh, we'll get, I mean, we'll get 90 or 80 of the events will be um, directed by this sort of detector where only six so, so the three minutes left for you by this sort of uh, this particular kind of detector so of course lost the feed from the uh, conference room. So let us wait for another few minutes. So while we get back the feed, uh, so there is another important session which has already started, um, the WGG session. And uh, please do attend that. I have shared the Zoom link for the session on the chat box. We still don't have a feed, but I'll wait for another two minutes if you could stand by. Can you message somebody like Divya or somebody? Uh, no, there's nothing here. Uh, anyway, that was probably you now over. And I'll just wait another minute and then we close. Yeah, so this is the problem with hybrid mode. We sometimes we get into mm. these kind of tricky things. Luckily, everything went well except for last five minutes. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, yeah. evening time and the traffic. Yeah. Bandwidth is good. Yes, yes. So in any case, I think I doubt if it will come get back uh, and the uh, next session would have already started. So thank you everyone for joining. And uh, yeah, we can consider this session as closed now. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you.
Uh, hi, can you make us a course, please? Like we, uh, we are just having like we can miss the most open internet troubles right now. So is it over? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, actually we just stopped the talk. Like it's last three minutes. You can maybe like uh, let him finish. Yeah. So we lost you almost for five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what is the status now, but uh, should we just call it a close or? Uh, it's lagging the last three minutes of presentation, so you can uh, just like he can finish the presentation. So you, uh, if you can make a post, we can still. One second. Yes. Yeah, we still have two audience online. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Sir, I know what to do. Hello, sir. I'm Maru. Yes. Hello. Okay, okay, sir. So what I was talking about, uh, like we have two layout at this moment. This is for Ascend Radio Array, layout for Ascend Radio Array. So where this smaller circle represents the placed array and which is ported in the right, whereas these arrays of these stations are not in a placed array configuration. And the other one is all the first this is at Nancy, France. So here, what happens? All these, uh, I mean, some dots are kind of faced there in the left, whereas these smaller, I mean, uh, these stations are also connected in a faced array uh, configuration. So the point is here, like this is referred as kind of say uh, te radio telescope, but we're not going to do that because radio telescope are having larger, I mean, set of say work or service uh, purpose to serve for, whereas. Uh, we will be having some simpler kind of architecture depending on both. I mean, maybe more intermediate between this array and this array. It has to be I mean, fixed in the few days. By saying, I would just like to say thank you and I'm going to end it here. Thank you. Thank you, Shuvadeep. And sorry for that disruption. So maybe if there are questions uh, from the hall, Please go on. Hi, this is The other session is starting now, so maybe we can all uh, we can have questions from the audience online, but uh, the oh, people here can ask uh, questions later. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. So. What, what was the thing that, if there's no question, then probably we could possibly bind up. And so let me thank you, uh, uh, Shuvadeep again, and thank all the speakers who um, participated and gave a talk. And thanks to all the audience also. We had around 24 max online audience and also the in-person audience who attended this meeting. Uh, so please do join the WGG session, which is already in progress. And uh, thank you once more. So this session is now closed. Thanks. Happy turn of.